thank you all for joining us. It really is a pleasure to have my friend Laura here. Um, I met Laura's first day at the United States Department of Justice, uh, the Civil Rights Division, the voting section where we worked, was the day on which Barack Obama got elected. It was election day, and she was in Washington manning the phones, dealing with all the complaints that you can imagine happens in a national election that go through the switchboard of the Justice Department. The rest of us were in the field. I was, I was leading our team in Mississippi, and we were wondering whether we should crank New Girl by calling a bunch of <laughs> random election I crimes. I knew that was you! And we decided that, and we decided because at that point we didn't quite know how the election would go that perhaps that might not be a good idea. But the world has changed since 2009 and the election of Barack Obama, and a lot of that change I think is reflected in this book, Just Pursuits. So I'm happy that she's here and has the opportunity to talk to us about it. So thank you. Um, I guess we should, the, the book deals about halfway through your experience at the DOJ. You were at the Civil Rights Division, where in the voting section, we were often welcomed as heroes. People would call, in particular people of color, would call the Department of Justice and ask us to come and to help sort out, in particular, we specialize in the race-based statute. So we'd go into towns, primarily in the South and the West, where either African Americans or Latinos were being disenfranchised. And so I guess I, I'm wondering, let's start with the transition from sort of being a hero in those communities. You were not- To what, Steve? To, <laughs> to what, what is the opposite, set up here to what's what? the opposite of a hero, a hero. that you to experienced? To some it would be a prosecutor, is, right? Okay. In some respects, unfortunately. Well, first, I'm so glad that I'm here. And so, so I said, thank you for coming out. You have a thousand places you could be. And thank you for being here. And I'm delighted because this is one of my closest friends in the entire world. Um, and we began our friendship in the Department of Justice, and so it's wonderful to see the work that he's doing, continuing to do, and it's just fun for me to be able to still um, have this rapport and obviously the experience of people who we know each other when we were on the, in, you know, on the front lines of things in particular. And you, you really mention it in a way that speaks to me because it's a foregone conclusion when you're in the Civil Rights Division for whom you are a champion. Right? Your allegiance is not questioned. It is obviously presumed that you are going to be trying to champion for those whose rights are traditionally infringed upon black and brown communities, really in the voting rights context. And um, when I transitioned over to the U.S. Attorney's Office, under the same umbrella of the Department of Justice, the perception was no longer that of a champion, but one who has betrayed the same community that you were once championing for. And it was not an internal perception that jarred me. It was how quickly I was presumed to have my own allegiance now questioned. The idea of having the parade, frankly, of black and brown men and women as defendants in the courtroom, even though there are black and brown victims, this perception that here I was, this black woman, standing where the presumed white man, the man, would be, it was a paradigm shift for me to be perceived that way. But it also made me question this fallacy that black and brown people are supposed to occupy but one role within our justice system in the criminal context, what as defendants and maybe defense counsel, and this idea that you could either be a proponent of civil rights or a prosecutor is stunning to me if you really want justice to actually be pursued and one day caught. And I think this book speaks to that in many respects, of that challenge that I felt and this personal battle of allegiance, we often spoke about it, um, talking about this idea of how oftentimes, you know, you know, you don't have this luxury of checking different facets of your identity at the door. You know, when I walk into a room, whether it's a courtroom, a boardroom, a classroom, this room, I don't shed my identity. I come in as a black woman, as a mother, as a wife, as a human being, as somebody, of course, a student of history like we all are. And when that happens, when you bring your entire self, you will find oftentimes your moral compass points one direction, and the orders that are given to you in the pursuit of justice can sometimes point a different direction. And I felt that as a criminal prosecutor more than I did in the Civil Rights Division. And there's a particular tension, I think, that you illustrate well in the book. Um, just a little bit of background. The District of Columbia is not a state. So they have a little bit different 
They have. Um, there are no rules in Washington, D.C. You to the extent that there are no rules. <laughs> You've seen Congress. Uh, there's no rules in Congress. It has, a hybrid, it has a hybrid system. There's an elected mayor, there's an elected city council, there's an elected attorney general who does very minor crimes, mm -hmm. fake IDs, that kind of stuff. But the criminal justice system is largely federal. Right. The chief prosecutor for the district is a uh, presidential appointee confirmed by the Senate. So are many of the judges. And so at this, at, at the DOJ, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, you saw the full gamut of everything that was sort of happening in the community. And you started, I believe, in uh, your first year was what, appeals and sex crimes mm -hmm. in particular. And so what, what in particular did you learn from those experiences just in your first year? Well, you know, it's important to think about that transition, because you're right, I went from doing the voting section to then doing appellate work and really still having an intellectual, I would say, approach to the practice of law in the form of being able to have that safe distance. You know, when you are still seeing the courtroom experience, you are reading about it, but you're not proactively the one actually trying cases quite yet for the first several months. And um, when you're doing that, you're reading about the errors that are made or the errors that are challenged. You're seeing the, you know, the Supreme Court precedent that's being brought in, your, your local precedent being brought in, and you're still having a bit of a law school classroom experience with the law. But then you go into the actual courtroom and you think to yourself, you have a bit of hubris and think, well, I've, I've handled these appeals, I've done these appeals, I've been in front of the appellate court, I've been a private lit litigator before, I've been in the courtrooms and federal courtrooms in my life, I've gone to DOJ after that. And um, I think you, you have this perception that you're going to get it and you can sort of hit the ground running. But I really equate it more to a train experience where you know, you're on a, you, you, know, you know a train, of course, you know the power of this locomotive. You know that when those pistons start going, the ferocity is going to be there. It's going to be this extraordinary machine. And you know that intellectually. But you're on a train platform, and all of a sudden, one whizzes by you. And you suddenly can feel the reverberations of that train. And it takes your breath away for a second. Take a step back, because you've now realized the intellectual force you were aware of, you're now seeing it and feeling it. And that's what it was like going into the criminal courtroom to try cases, to handle matters immediately. That feeling of being on a train platform and going, I've just gone from knowing to beginning to understand something. And, and in that, you know, when you see intellectually, we know what disproportionate impact is. You intellectually know about disparate impact and about the mass incarceration, and you know these concepts, and then you see it time and time again. That first day I actually said, I turned to somebody who I was, who was training me for a second to go in and say, here's how you just mad. You had a stack of manila, aunt, manila folders, you know, about 30 or 40 matters that day were coming in and you're up there and they say go and you're supposed to stand up and do it. And I'm returning to my colleague and saying, where are the white people? <laughs> and if you know, they were like, coats on the bench. And we're talking about Washington, D.C. And obviously black and brown communities do not have a monopoly on crime, but in the, I would say, thousands of matters you would oversee as a prosecutor, I can count on one hand, it doesn't require every single finger. The number of times I saw a white defendant in any courtroom, in, in not just my own, in the courthouse. And I remember thinking, now how can this be? And, I, and you can't answer the question of saying, well, it's about white officers. No, there were many black and brown officers as well. And they're black and brown victims as well. But so you go from seeing this disproportionate and disparate and wondering, how does this happen in this state of affairs, in this country today? And, and I, I think about it in terms of that transition and how even going from the appellate process to the trial courtroom and then trying many, many cases, that still never, that, that never got out of my mind. And that disparity comes up at several points in the book, but it's not only the treatment of white defendants, but the preference and sort of bending over backwards sometimes for white complainants. Yes. You know, I write about that in a chapter call, uh, called, um, it's called The Chew, and it's about privilege. And we talk about privilege in our society all the time. And certainly, as a member of the Department of Justice, there's an element of privilege that I was a beneficiary of. 
the kind of privilege that says someone will extend the benefit of the doubt. The same way you probably do to police officers. If you're a juror, one of the first questions you're asked for voir dire is, would you give more or less weight to an officer because they're an officer? And you're gonna over them to like, okay, I'd give him more weight because it's an officer testifying in this case. And the officer may not be the person, obviously, who's the, um, the, the victim or the defendant, they're just a, the neutral observer. So I'm gonna give more weight, of course. That's one of the first questions we ask because we know full well that that is a benefit of the doubt that's given. On the same token, how often you yourself, well, I mean, I know there's a presumption of innocence in this country, but they wouldn't have prosecuted unless they had something on this person, right? There must be something going on. The FBI, who kind of hates in our case as well, the, the law enforcement, the weight of the federal government is not gonna come down on you because you did nothing. So it's really something. And that's a beneficiary of the doubt for the Department of Justice, where you think to yourself, what are you gonna do with those benefits of the doubt? Are you going to wield that power in a way and exploit that beneficial um, opportunity and privilege? Or are you going to temper it by ensuring that you're protecting your civil rights? And so privilege, I speak in this position of thinking and knowing that as that member, as a pros the prosecutor, I had that privilege in some respects. But then you have the privilege to talk about in the court of public opinion and more colloquially. And the idea of feeling in our society who is entitled to be a victim. And what rights, oddly enough, come along with that. And part of those rights are the ability to wield your influence and say, I don't care what's happened on any other case. I don't care the volume of work you have. I care not at all about whether this crime was particularly violent or what it is. I was wrong, and because it happened to me and my perception of how I should be treated in society, you need to act on my behalf. And so you have cases, we call them the papering process, when somebody, when you, an officer comes in and when someone's arrested and they bring in the case to the prosecutor, and they'll say, here's what happened, here's the arrest, you're gonna paper this or not. Meaning, are you gonna charge the defendant like I want you to or not? And you make decisions whether to paper or not to paper the called no paper and you can imagine with limited resources and with the sheer scope of crimes you're gonna make some judgment calls that perhaps some victims are not going to be as comfortable with maybe it's not an outright no paper maybe it's what happened to you as a misdemeanor not a felony and you sometimes will ask the, the, the crass questions of okay well there's a knife involved I mean did it hit an artery or are we talking about a nick Questions I would think before I was a prosecutor would be like, what do you mean, there was a knife, who cares, it's a knife, what are you talking about? And they go, no I know, but here's, I, this. there's 75 people on the lockup list this morning, and you've got about maybe 12 homicides, and you've got you know, a dozen or so rapes, and you've got child abuse, and you've got violent crimes, and you've got, they're all violent crimes obviously, you've got drug offenses, so you're gonna assign cases because somebody got slapped and is not cooperative. These are things, the tensions you really have. And so you have a victim in this, in this particular case who was trying to use the justice system as an opportunity to um, uh, evict a roommate. And because that was her goal, she insisted on making sure that it didn't matter what else she had, don't you know who I am? And who she was was somebody who felt entitled. And that was a tension because it was not only the prosecutor, I mean, I was the person in charge that day of deciding whether to charge the case, but you had the officers who I had watched time and time again minimize the, the feelings that a victim had in other crimes, but often bend it over backward for the purported, now we call them the Karens, right, of the world, because squeaky wheels get the oil. And there was never a thought or wanting to have the complaints come in and the choices I would see often made to accommodate those who felt that they would be vocal about it. And that's that's not what we want to be. Yeah. And so, you know, that that to me raises another question. You, you mentioned that a lot of the primary stakeholders and the, and the actors in the criminal justice system are indeed people of color. Yeah. And you have examples of African American judges acting in ways that are sometimes quite surprising in the book. And I guess, I'm, I've always sort of been curious about the tension that in particular black law enforcement and black prosecutors have. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you saw serious crimes, and yes. sometimes some of those very serious, heartbreaking crimes were committed by African Americans, right? But on the other hand, as you said, you know, we've seen these disparities in bail, in sentencing, in prosecution, in policing, and so how how there there are clearly there are still clearly victims out there who need a champion. Of course, but there's also sort of this history and legacy that you're also going up against. So, I mean, how how do, how does one resolve that? Particularly, you have such power and such discretion as in what to charge, how to pursue, how to recommend a sentence, whether to take a plea or not. You know, it's not always easy to resolve, and I can't say that I universally did resolve it. What I can say is, you know, what I grew to understand, perhaps instinctively and putting by through experience, was that when you stood up and said Laura Coates on behalf of the people of the United States, that necessarily included the defendant. It just does. It includes the defendant. It includes, obviously, the victim of the crime. And in the so-called victimless crimes, which are normally drug offenses and possession cases, um, where society is offended by something, you know, it includes society. But because of the amount of power you exercise, and incidentally, please don't have the impression that because you see a lot of high-profile cases where the attorney general weighs in, or you have U.S. attorney weighing in, and you think everything's where it gets run up the chain, the, uh, most of the cases, if not the overwhelming majority, are handled by individual prosecutors with, with, who are exercising autonomy and don't check with anyone. There's no like, no one's pulling you aside and saying, if this, it, here's the formulaic approach to how you prosecute, here's the formulaic approach of how you decide how to sentence or what you're asking for outside the guidelines, where are you in the ranges? Here are the facts you need to use in order to um, decide to build your case, build your case up. No, it's just baptism by fire. It's go. Lawyers are presumed generalists, as you know. Um, I equate it almost to telling somebody at a cocktail party that you're a doctor, you will have people's afflictions out the window. They're like, oh great, you're a doctor, great. Here's my thing. <laughs> I've got a spine issue. And they're like, well, actually I'm a podiatrist. That's fine. Tell me more about this. Okay, Let whatever. me show you this yeah. rash. Yeah, here's, here's, here's this rash. You have, you have a second? No, I don't have any time. I don't want to look at the rash at all, right? And so lawyers are the same. We both practice something. And so because you're presumed a generalist as a lawyer, you would think it different as a prosecutor, but you are presumed a generalist as well there. And you're presumed to just get it and figure it out. And part of the sort of camaraderie is the, the hazing that goes on of you'll figure it out and build your credibility along the way. And so um, when you think about you know, how this is sort of structured and the way, the, the way you have discretion, and knowing that because of those individual decisions that are being made, um, you know you have responsibility if the defendants also who you represent, even if you're not that person's attorney, you alone are gonna have the exculpatory evidence that can show the person's innocence, right? The officers are not handing over documents to the defense attorney they're handing over to you, you have responsibility. Anything you get has to be provided over defense counsel. And there are obviously very easy ways, if you are not an ethical person, to just sort of sweep things under the rug because it's inconvenient to the case you're trying to build. But you have a duty to turn that over. If you if you know that your officer has um, you know acquired information or evidence because they you know violated the Fourth Amendment, and you now you can't get it in because it'll be an issue with that that particular amendment. You could try to just say, well, we're on the same team here, so it's okay, I'll figure out how to get this in. Or you could be responsible and prudent about it, knowing the power you hold and wield. And so, you know, that, that's a tension you're talking about, the idea that that dynamic at play of, of what you do about that. And it's not because you believe the person is innocent and therefore want to give the person a, a lifeline, although they are presumed innocent, but for a prosecutor, we had the same notion of, well, I wouldn't be having a grand jury indict you if I actually thought you were innocent, right? I have to figure out how to prove my case. It doesn't mean that you are going to be, in my mind, viewed as somebody who's innocent until proven guilty, because I'm the one who has to prove it, and here's how I'm gonna do it. And so you have to sort of think to yourself of what you're gonna do with that power, and I write about this in the book at different moments, what the grand jury process is like, and sort of peeling back that curtain, and how that really looks, and the discretion it's used, and, and also about those moments when you bring that lived experience of that healthy skepticism when you know that if you hear 
the script of a police officer at times. Tell you statements like, what happened next? Well, then I gave chase. Okay, this is officer talk. Do you mean you started running? Yes. And then, um, you know, this person, the door was ajar. The door was open. And when you hear these sort of code words, they're sometimes reciting the script they know from the Supreme Court that says, here's how we justify a particular use of force. And they very well may be justified. But when you hear the script, something sort of spidey sense should come up and say, so this might be an issue, right? And if you don't bring in who you are, if you don't think of yourself as the prosecutor on behalf of that person, there is no opportunity for a viable defense. There's just not. And I remember you and I would talk about this, and I would say it was one of this, this career for me, um, unlike you know anything I think human beings normally look at, is it was the one time in my life, Stephen, that I dreaded getting better at something, right? It was painful to be to increase your expertise because you were all the more aware that the second the file was handed to you, I know how to win this case. Done. Forget the indicting a ham sandwich. I know what I need to do in this case. Great. And then you say, oh, what are the names? And you watch a person, a human being, walk into the courtroom. And I was telling my husband, I, you know, I never, um, one that I could never get used to, and still can't, is this is the the eyes of a frightened person. Whether it's the victim that I'm remembering what happened to them, or they're telling me, or the person whose eyes are at the defense counsel at table and they're kind of wildly searching and wondering, is she going to be good enough? Is there a hope? Is there any way? I can get out of this. Is there any way I won't be viewed as a monster? And that took a toll on me to see, because the better I got, the less justice could, the less of a viable defense could ever be given or made. And that's really not where justice is supposed to be, right? And you have several excellent examples in there, but one of the more compelling is there's a instance of mistaken identity. Mm. And um, I'll let you share the tale, but you know, had you not sort of responded to your gut, everyone else was pretty ready to send the guy to jail. Yeah. You know, I I think we I think when it happened, I feel like I may have been on the phone with you like, Can you believe this happened? Blah, blah, blah. You know, I had those we had those moments of catharsis when you're almost that sounding board of you won't believe what happened today. And I tell you just as a personal note, if you ever have a chance to be at a party or lunch with the prosecutors, we got stories to tell. <laughs> we got the stories to tell. Um, whether you want to hear them, I mean, this these stories you should all read, of course. <laughs> but and we got the, and, 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 and your yes, friendship. Yeah. We have these very salacious things that happen, and you have moments of I can't believe I'm I, I'm sitting here and there's a felony case because two brothers are fighting over who ate the last of the cocoa puffs. What? And there and this has happened, right? and cops come in and have their stories. But that is just a tale of how a lot of the stories you hear and the ways that you know we sort of have these water cooler moments, you really have seen and heard it all by the end. And one thing you've heard more than anything is, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. There's an old Shaggy song, it wasn't me. There's a video, it wasn't me. There's an eyewitness, it wasn't me. There's a video of you saying, this is me. It wasn't me, right? And that happens. And so the idea of someone professing their innocence in a criminal courtroom is sort of par for the course. And it's almost it becomes a ministerial moment in time. And in this instance, it was a black man who was insistent that, if, that we had gotten the wrong person. Not only had he not violently assaulted this woman um, who claimed that they had a child together, he'd never fathered a child and had no idea who she was. And we couldn't find this person because of because the victim security laws, that she couldn't tell him who she was, and he had no way of really being able to defend himself. And he was insistent that it was mistaken identity. And when you don't have a cooperative witness, it's okay. As long as you had police officers and other corroborating data, they didn't need to show up and actually testify. And so this is a case I had, you know, I was running a routine calendar where, um, because the government attorneys are so fungible, you know, to the point where, doesn't matter, it's your, your case or not, here's your assignment for the day, you're handling the status hearing in this courtroom. Anything that comes in, you're handling it. And you're dropping off files and saying, writing little notes and saying, here's what I want as a sentence, go ahead, there's what it is, right? 
So I had this case in front of me, and I was picking it up for the first time. Within moments of hearing this man say, it's not me, you've got to believe me, and pleading his case, and there was, there was a black defense attorney as well who was there, and he was talking about the idea this was not him, and I had a, a white judge, a woman, who was berating him and was um, mocking him and having the impression again of, really, this isn't you? Oh, really? Oh, how lovely. Really, it's not you. And Loma was leaning towards me for that camaraderie to join in on the mockery and sort of have that moment of haughty derision of, I'm, Your Honor, that's what they all say. And that could have bought me some points for credibility to get on the good side of the judge, but little secret, it's the, not the judge's courtroom, it's the prosecutor's, right? And um, they don't know that or like that. And they'll tell you, it's not the prosecutor's, it's my court. We'll be like, really, Your Honor? Who's the government right now? Okay, fine. And so in those moments, you don't have to always be deferential, but obviously it's, it, it can be beneficial to be that way. And so in this case, I, I started to sort of turn away because I didn't know about this case. I don't, I don't know what this matter is. And I've heard this a thousand times today that it wasn't you. But something about watching this woman mock him and the attorney kind of doing what he could and then essentially throwing up his hands, well, we tried. I thought to myself, How, well, hold on a second. What if he's right? And what will it take for me to check? I don't know how I'm supposed to confirm in this moment, and I write about what was required to do so and what the judge wanted me to do and was really irritated that I would even indulge for a moment these antics, and I would surely pay for this in the future, she inferred. And I said, well, let me, let, let's, what would it take? This blink moment you have where, look, I'm a black woman in America. I've, I've certainly seen and heard the statement of we don't all look alike. Officers do get it wrong sometimes. People get it wrong sometimes. You have eyewitness testimony that gets it wrong a lot of the time. It's been discredited in some instances. So what, what, just what if I took a moment and didn't have on the back end of an exoneration or thinking decades later this person should not be in prison after all and they may have some sort of pittance of compensation sent to them to say, we're sorry for the inconvenience. I hope you can go along with your life and we'll try to get that felony conviction off your record at some point. So maybe you can get gainfully employed again. Maybe you can go near a school again where you can vote. And so um, I tell him this story, it's, it wasn't me, about this notion of what it took. And let me tell you, what was the most infuriating and, and saddening and maddening part was I didn't even have to go the extra mile, you guys. It was an extra inch to confirm, no, it wasn't him. It wasn't him. And going back to that courtroom where the judge, you would think, may have that moment of realization, and you think in a Hollywood movie, right? The judge will have this epiphany and go, oh my God, this could have gone horribly wrong. I'm so sorry. And learn from it. Instead, it was, Ms. Coates apologized to the man. Mm. You know? And those thoughts. And so it, it, in those moments, I, I, I wanted people to see that there were those moments of why it was impactful to unapologetically bring yourself into the courtroom and question the way you would in the court of public opinion and question the idea of knowing, hey, I just said I was standing on behalf of the people of the United States of America. That meant him today. That meant him. And I could have been wrong. He could have been, it could have been a shaggy notion of, no, that's you. Yeah, this is you. It's absolutely you. But I wasn't willing to take that chance that day. And it changed the way I approached other cases from that moment on. And you know, with your work in Innocence Project as well. I mean, imagine all the cases you've worked on, Stephen, if somebody had a blink moment before. And somebody had taken the time to extend the dignity of the benefit of the doubt that I readily received as a prosecutor. We often say that the leading cause of wrongful conviction is hubris. Mm -hmm. It's just people thinking they've got it right and not really doing the type of diligence that you should. Wow. One of the other things that I think the book demonstrates well is not only the extent to which the criminal justice system disproportionately punishes some folks, but also um, you illustrate in detail 
way that the criminal justice system can, in many ways, eat up the victim. Yeah. And yeah. the person who calls who has been victimized by some crime, and the and and the system doesn't leave them better. It leaves sometimes leaves them far worse. It's true. I mean, and you know, I wrote this. First of all, this book is is episodic in nature. So every chapter stands alone. Um, and I, I did that intentionally because, first of all, you know, I think people have the assumption that, that a lawyer is going to write a book or maybe I would write a book that is very a legal textbook in a classroom. I loved law school. Those don't appeal to me. I want storytelling. I am influenced and persuaded and compelled through storytelling, through understanding what has happened and seeing it for myself. And so I invite people on this vicarious experience and journey to, to, to travel with me and sort of know and think about what choice would you have made in a particular instance? And if you find yourself having no alternatives, then what does that say about what needs to change, right? If there is this chasm between what is right and what is lawful or what ought to be illegal and what is actually wrong or what is ethical, and what you're, you're required to do, there is room, that's where reform comes in, it's in that space. And it relates to victims in particular, you know, um, I write several chapters, um, one about she needed me to believe her, about a woman who, I tell you, is so uncanny even to this day. We could have been twins. I mean, forget, to, you know, uh, from another mother, we could have been twins. And watching this woman who was savagely attacked by her fiance and father of a child. And, and watching her go through a process of, I didn't, didn't think this would ever be me. It's not me, I don't wanna be here. Are you judging me? What do you think of me? What are you doing? What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts right now? I need to know how you're feeling. Cause I wanna know if, if there's a reason I can run out of here or is there a reason to stay? And I don't wanna be here. This isn't me. If you believe that it's not me, this is not who I am. I would never be this woman, or whatever that her thoughts were, and probably because she had judged other people in that situation and thought, you know, as we all do in a way, we judge people's choices and we question whether they can be a victim or not because we feel safer, I think, if the only if what it what keeps us from, keeps us from being the victim is a choice. When Rarely is it your, ever your choice to be a victim. When is your ever your choice, right? So this notion of saying, as long as I don't do what this person did, I'm gonna be safe in this world. If I don't walk down the dark alley, if I don't dress a certain way, if I don't date the wrong person, whatever that means, if I um, get this degree, if I had lived in this area, if whatever it is, you make these statements to make yourself feel secure. And um, when people find themselves in this situation, they question the same way that we would all question their choices and lack thereof, and they wonder. And she and I had this conversation, right, right about in the book about how we were constantly switching roles, this twin of mine, of wanting to say the right things, not being able to find the words, knowing that our, that our directives and what was driving us was different, and knowing that I was not her personal attorney. It might surprise you when you watch television shows and they say, um, I don't want to press charges. And all of a sudden like, the attorney goes, oh, okay, well, I guess we're done here. It's not how it works in reality. If you don't want to press charges, okay, that means you're an uncooperative victim. But do I have enough to go forward even if you don't care to go forward? And if I do, it doesn't matter whether you want to go forward. It doesn't matter at all. Because I'm not the personal attorney. I'm providing that the next victim will not exist. It's society who's been offended. Therefore, I'm prosecuting this person because I don't want the next person to now be a victim. And in this chapter, it having to, to sort of uh, thread that impossible needle at times of wanting to advocate, of course, for the victim and knowing that your scope is much different and needing the person to come along, but you can't you know, lead a horse to water and make it drink. And there are concerns, obviously, as well. If that person were to recant later, what can they say? I was pressured into saying that the prosecutor, I, this never happened. The prosecutor wanted me to do it. That's why we're here. And you're looking at yourself going, I, that's why we're here? But understanding psychologically, 
that's what some people need to say. And this is women and men. There's also a, a chapter, and I begin this book with this, Steve, and this was one I know you know was something that um, was deeply troubling and still is even to this day. It can be difficult for me to even to write about it, let alone talk about it, but I begin the book talking about how the pursuit of justice can create injustice. And you may wonder, how can that possibly be? And it's because sometimes when we think about justice as only a verdict, an a, a, you know, acquittal or a conviction, we often believe the ends justifies whatever means occurs. And in this case, I write in the, in the first chapter, I begin the book, and again, I don't suffer any fools in my commentary, so why spare myself in the criticism and the roles that I have played? And I talk about how a victim of a car theft um, pinged with an active deportation warrant. And as is required of anyone with a warrant who comes into a courtroom, you know, prosecutors run background checks if you're a witness in our cases. Could you alert the marshals or safety concerns, perhaps, or anything else? And when that pinged, it triggered an obligation to report to ICE that was immediate. And you think about, is that fair? Is that right? We want people to report crimes, right? We have a vested interest in reporting crimes. Imagine if it was a sexual assault victim or a murder victim or anything else. Or are we supposed to just because you're an undocumented person who's been in the country for decades, by the way, and have not supposed to sneeze in direction of an officer since? When we want them to report crimes, what happens? Are we giving them the choice of saying either you remain in the shadows and continue being exploited or harmed, or you report? and you yourself are treated as if you're the same type of criminal as the person who would engage in the actions against you. And um, those were, that was one of those moments when, and I, I, you know I fought, I fought like hell to try to avoid and, and went up the chain and down the chain and figuring out is there any way, even possibly, do you wanna consider dismissing the case? I knew that wasn't going to happen, but even just as a, Let's talk about the injustice that's going to occur right now. This can't be what happens. And having to be converted into his private counsel to advocate, trying to remember my Spanish vocabulary as I'm reaching for his cell phone, asking for his password, talking to his wife, trying to figure out where to go next in his, light, his worst nightmare as members of law enforcement are looking at me going, whose side are you on? There's no clean hands here. Let someone else, wait, what do you care, right? And, and to imagine a, a, a victim of a crime, and even then, you know he was still willing to help. Still, all a man had done was get up in the morning to go to work and found his car not there. And more than what, 20, 30 years later, was getting ready to find himself on a database, deported to a country that he obviously does not know. These are questions that I know other prosecutors have wrestled with when it comes to cooperating witnesses or, or the idea of our immigration policies and what we believe and stand for justice-wise, but in a tangible, practical sense, the choices you are forced to make in these battles of allegiances. And I, I, I bring people on this journey in the book to talk about that. Um, I think we're gonna, uh, one more question, and then we'll open it up to okay. questions for um, this tie is driving me crazy. I'm putting it over here. I'm putting it over here. Well, I told I, you I was you gonna, tie it. I was going to, you told me not to tie it. I hate him. <laughs> um, he said, it's be more casual. And I was like, I'm I didn't even know casual. it was a tie. I thought it was a scarf. Um, <gasps> so I, uh, my fault for listening to him. Yes. So, um, <laughs> four years you worked there. Four years. Um, what was the experience like on the last day? Well, you know, I'm very, um, symbolic, and so I walked out, I chose MLK Day to be free at last, free at last, thank God I'm my free at last. Uh, but we really, I look at, I, I wrote from this particular perspective of when I was, um, I had two back-to-back -back babies, they're, they're actually here now. They're now seven and nine years old. They're the ones sleeping in the back. Um, <laughs> we're waving, going, yes, it's me. Hello, I'm here. Um, and, uh, and I wrote it really, this, these chapters I curated because it was when I was pregnant with them, or I just had them, mostly, and I wanted them to understand what I was figuratively carrying while carrying them. 
I wanted them to understand not only what the justice system, what the legal system aspiring to be a justice system really was, but also what my role was within it. Not to self-aggrandize, but to tell the truth. And I think that's a very powerful form of activism, truth-telling and information providing. And I didn't want to just, like I do on CNN, talking about what the law is and how it's interpreted and talking about it from this vantage point 10,000 feet up. I wanted people to see what the law feels like as well and what justice and the pursuit really feels like. Because that's where I think we find the common understanding that needs to, um, it's more impactful. I wanted to see something and say something. So when I look back at my time, I am, I'm very proud that I had the opportunity to serve as a public servant for the Department of Justice. Most proud of our work in the voting section. And there are moments I write about in the book as well, um, very proud of moments of being able to feel like you caught justice as well not just pursued it. But I also will be most proud thinking about this time if I had a small role in not just speaking truth to power, but helping people to know what the truth actually is. And then have it be a catalyst. And I'll be proud to look back, hopefully that the issues that we talk about today that, that remain evergreen will be in the rearview mirror or in history books for my children, as opposed to the daily lived experiences explaining why the world is the way it is. And clearly the world hungers for that. It's a New York best-selling, New York Times best-selling book. It received a rave from the Times. Thank you. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. I didn't receive a rave from the Times. I'm not at all jealous. The Times didn't even open my book. But, but you know what? They should have. They it's should remarkable. have. It's and you know it is. You know yes. it is. Of course it is. It's called Kegs of Carthage. It's amazing. <laughs> it's a beautiful book. You know I love it. Let's take questions from the audience. If anybody. Um, my question is around the Arbery case, which I think you commented on at CNN, and I think you mm -hmm. follow. There was a story yesterday. I don't know. You might not have got a chance to read about it, but a federal judge dismissed a plea bargain. If you didn't get to read about it, I'll ask a different question. I know the case, yes. I mean, that, you know what happened yesterday? I know that, they, that the Department of Justice said they weren't going to go forward with the plea because of victim impact statements, or victim impacts were not alerted. Is that what you're talking about? So, exactly. So okay. my question is, I tuned in, I said, they're going to have Laura Coach talk about this on <laughs> CNN tonight. And she and, was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, I didn't do it. <laughs> And I didn't know I was going to get to ask you personally about it. But it seems like a gamble on the part of the family and the judge to do that because it's based on a what if, if the case gets thrown out on appeal, mm -hmm. that they could get um, nothing right. versus getting something with the federal case, yeah. which seemed a really interesting and weird concept to me. And I wonder if you can comment on that. Maybe you need to tell the story a little bit. Well, sure. Well, um, is everyone familiar with the Ahmaud Arbery um, killing? It's a 25-year-old black man running in Santilla Shores in Georgia, and he was chased and hunted down and eventually killed by a father and son, the last name Michael, and their neighbor, William Roddy Bryan. And they were all convicted of murder. And the, the Mike McMichaels will serve life up possibly in parole for the state murder conviction, and the neighbor will serve um, 30... Uh, Life, up, life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. So most state, most homicide cases are state level crimes. The federal government gets involved, obviously, if you're talking about more mass killings or interstate issues or hate crimes, where you have an element of why the crime was committed based on bias, based on um, a prejudice, based on what happened with Matthew Shepard and, and John Byrd case. Uh, Jamesburg, excuse me, case in uh, Texas. So usually the federal government provides a backstop for state level cases. In the event that the prosecution is unsuccessful, they can still come in and venture to prosecute effectively. You're seeing that happen, say, with the Derek Chauvin trial, where he now pled out with the federal case and the other officers have other things going on about these issues, I believe. So the reason this is important is because when they got the state conviction, which is life without possibility of parole, for the two McMichaels. Normally, um, the federal crime comes in next to try to prove that case. You notice in the case, they never talked about race. It, was, it wasn't an issue that was part of the prosecution strategy 
likely because there's a hate crime federal case pending. They didn't want to mess it up for whatever reason. Now, the federal trial was supposed to begin. And instead of having a trial, the prosecutors offered a plea deal where the McMichaels, at least, would be required to serve the first 30 years in a federal prison to avoid trial, but you're guaranteed 30 years in a federal prison. Why that's important for a federal prosecutor is, one, you avoid the trial. Two, for one, it's the equivalent of a life sentence for the father, likely. More importantly, even if the state level appeal of the murder conviction overturns the conviction, it doesn't matter. They remain in prison for the first 30 years at least, if not more. No opportunity to appeal from a plea necessarily. So they would have a guaranteed sort of incarcerated bird in hand. The family did not want that to happen because federal penitentiaries are viewed as more of a cushier scenario than a state level overcrowded prison. People are thinking about the Martha Stewart-esque camps you think about, right? Not really the case, frankly, for most federal prisons. No one describes them as very cushy, but comparatively speaking to say a state Georgia prison, the thought was it would be more comfortable and therefore a gift to these two men, at least. So you're required as a prosecutor to um, consult with the victim's family before you provide a plea offer, or before you finalize a plea offer, really. But consult is more like, let me tell you what I'm gonna do, or here's what I just did. It's not about getting permission in advance, because again, you're not my client. You, it's a courtesy that's extended to tell you what's going on, to keep you apprised of what's happening. The family was very insulted by the idea that this was presumption that they would be getting a cushier deal, and they should have been consulted, and this is wrong, and they want the book thrown at them. I understand, of course, emotionally why they believe that. So the Kristen Clark, who is the Deputy Attorney General, Assistant Attorney General, excuse me, um, initially had conveyed, signed off on this offer, because it's a high profile case, and then learned, she said, that the family was not aware, and decided to hold off until this coming Friday on this case. In the meantime, the judge said, we're not gonna sign off on this issue. So, um, the, the, it's, it's one of those moments of how you realize that justice is a cost-benefit analysis. Either you risk the state court of conviction being overturned, and they walk free, while the federal trial is pending, or you fail to be able to truly prove someone's intent, which is what was required of a hate crime. I gotta get in your head, or tell a jury to get in your head, they did it because they were bigoted against black people. Could they wait until the appeal process goes through? The trial jury was already convened. They already had the voir dire process to begin, to, I think on Monday it was supposed to begin. And they continued to do the summons in the event that it was not successful because why plea offers go through the Why is the federal government feeling that they needed to be involved given that he'd been convicted? at the state level. He had not yet been convicted when they began the federal prosecution. Well, can't they stop it once he gets... They could. Sure, yeah, they, sure. They, they could, but hate crimes are on the books because it is so offensive to society that it occurred. And unlike normal crimes, so to speak, where you as an individual are targeted, the uncertainty that anyone could be victim to it, based on your perception of your race, your religion, sexual orientation, and the like, means we can all be vulnerable at any moment in time. And for that reason, the government has a, even more of a vested interest in saying we will ensure this is deterred by prosecuting with the full weight of the law. Thank you. But they could. And also in the government mind, if I can add, yeah. it, it, it is a different crime, right? Yes. So a state murder, murders happen every day. But, um, you know, are, are they, happen, yeah. Yeah, they happen every day. But in the Department of Justice and Congress is in the United States mind, this is a different thing, right? This was the deprivation of someone's civil rights in, in a way that they died. And so it's not just, uh, and it's not just this. Every case that I think can think of from Rodney King, the federal government came, over, came away and said, yes, you killed somebody, but there's a bigger constitutional issue here. Yep. Yes, sir. Ma'am, maybe I misunderstood you, but did I, get the feeling that said after you became more and more cases prosecuted, you actually felt bad about how good you got at your job? I mean, isn't there usually, if someone goes to trial or there, uh, or is, uh, you know, goes to a grand jury or, you know, goes to, uh, you know, felony court, 
aren't you guys pretty much pretty much almost 100% sure that the person did it? Yeah, you are. You, you, that's why you've gone through the process and the guardrails are up. But due process requires an opportunity for a person to be able to at least mount a defense. Mm-hmm. And what I, was, what I was saying was the idea of um, there is a tremendous amount. You don't want to find your name on the other side of United States' verses. Because even for those who might be able to insert a seed of reasonable doubt, the way the government's too strong to do that effectively. And so if you really think about due process and what the presumption of innocence is supposed to stand for, it is oftentimes difficult to, to know that before a trial has begun, before a fact finder, before a juror is even seated, that this person has only zero chance of success. And it's not about you know, whether the person was guilty in my mind about what happened. It's about what we, what we should believe in terms of even the ability to have a shot. Otherwise, it can feel much like judge, jury, and executioner, the second officer arrests somebody, right? And that, 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 that's not something I think is supposed to um, idealistically happen. There should be at least an opportunity to present or defense if you choose to do so, which not everyone does, if you choose to do so. And the reason it's, more, it's also very important is because of how a lot of cases don't go to trial. A lot of cases are pled out. And they're pled out because they're aware of what it means to be on the other side of that V. And if they're incarcerated pending trial because they can't afford you know, bail, they have to pay for a presumption of innocence in this country, um, that means that they're not judging whether they can mount a defense. They're saying, how long can I survive in jail? And how do I measure that up against what? So I'm, I'm innocent, or it wasn't me, but you're, ask, you're saying you, you, you'll you recommend three years in prison as opposed to 25 under the guidelines? I'll take it. That's, that's the kind of conundrum that I saw presented that I was always very uncomfortable with. And it wasn't that I felt at times, when, when, by the time of the trial, I was quite assured that obviously I was bringing the case against the right person. But the weight of the government should not foreclose one's opportunity to mount a defense. That feels a lot like why jolly old England was rejected. You know, the idea of a king deciding you. You, that's it. And sometimes with our justice justice system, it's the, the officer's arrest, the officer's stop, is the domino effect. So by the time you get to me, the last one can fall and it's checkmate. I realize I've you know, morphed metaphors, dominoes <laughs> to chess, but you get it. You get it. <laughs> well, you know, like it took forever to put John Gotti away, you know, and he fought the government, per yeah. se. Yeah. Well, there's a song, I fought the law and the law won for a reason, right? <laughs> so it, it can happen, and it's not about, you know, the idea of that everyone should be a bleeding heart, so to speak and everyone gets off because the system is unfair. But there's the recognition that there is an imbalance in a system that we pride ourselves on of a mascot with a blindfolded woman holding scales of justice that are presumed to be balanced. And that's just not the reality. And what we need to do or think about is how we wreck, how we change that in some way to make it such that for a nation that believes in due process, it occurs. For a nation that believes in the presumption of innocence, it's not having to be paid for. And for somebody to be able to have an opportunity and the government to say, we've got the burden of proving beyond a result. You have no, you don't do anything as a defendant. Well, we, we can't very well say to them, to defendants, you know what, hey, you don't have to take the stand. It's my job to prove the case against you. You're here because I brought you here. You have to do a thing. In reality, it's, you really can't do a thing. So. I'm, mindful, I, I'm, I'm a professor and I'm also a criminal defense attorney. You know, I'm, I'm mindful that maybe, maybe we're in some ways talking about two different things, right? There's whether the person did it and whether the person was convicted pursuant to our values. And so when prosecutors receive cases, they're always imperfect, right? Yeah. And especially if the police touch them, they are especially imperfect. <laughs> and so the more experience that a prosecutor gets, the more they are sort of ironing out those imperfections or knowing how to stop those imperfections from becoming public. And those were the skills you were getting quite good at. Yeah. And so, you know, a search and seizure issue, because Laura could see it coming a long way away when she got better at her job, 
it, that could have been the thing that could break or win a case for regardless of whether the person is innocent or guilty. And so, you know, I think that's when she says that the, the, the government runs the courtroom, they really do. I mean, because they just have such amazing access to the witnesses, the evidence, and how people think about the case. Yeah. Well, sure. I wish my niece could be here because she's the assistant district attorney of Hudson, Wisconsin, so she could probably relate to what mm -hmm. you're talking about. Yeah. And it's something that, you know, I think you just, we're, all, we're human beings, right? Mm -hmm. And I think being able to compartmentalize things is very aspirational, right? You, you think in your mind that, okay, I'll just, just deal with it, right? Just that's it. Well, this, this is how it goes. Here's the directive. Here's the order. You do it. But I, I really believe that there's so much nuance. And I really believe that because individual prosecutors have such discretion and power, that we have to recognize what that would mean to have a patchwork of approaches to justice. And I had many great colleagues who I respect so much. I also write about colleagues I don't respect at all. Because the those way, are the good ones. And those, and those, the one, the one, those are the good stories, right? The ones that wielded power for the sake of being able to. The ones who wanted to train me on purportedly how to interrogate black defendants, or the ones who wanted to show me here's how it's done, or what judges can do in victim blaming and shaming, and how in a Me Too world talking about believe women, that's in the court of public opinion. In a courtroom, we haven't evolved the same way, haven't at all. And so because of things like this, the idea of thinking, well, how do you, how do you realize that every juror coming in is an individual and then pretend we have a uniform application of the law, right? We, we voir dire you intentionally to see who, who's it, who, for whom will this story resonate? Huh, something about you makes me say, this person's gonna be more amenable to what I want them to know. You're sort of grooming and thinking about it in that respect. Because we know as prosecutors and defense counsel, frankly, that individuals are gonna go in with their own preconceived notions, their own individual bias, whether it's at a conscious level or not, and that will dictate what happens here today. And the law is only part of the equation. And I'm so dealing with how I feel about that. <laughs> uh, one last question. You know, in Alphabet City, which is Washington, D.C., they don't want any more letters to change with the acronyms. So they're not going to do that. DOJ is short and sweet, my friend. DOLS, they don't want it. <laughs> they don't want it. But, but I, I, hear, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I wonder if the average person appreciates the nuance. When we so often hear, we're a nation of laws, and people feel good about that. They think, well, we're a nation of laws, and whether it's true and who it applies to and equal protection, different story entirely. But I think, the, I think that notion of, even though it's true, that we really are a legal system aspiring to be a justice system, we're also in America aspiring to truly realize who we are on paper. And we know that, right? It's the great American experiment that we're still working out the kinks on. We have a hypothesis. Even the now retiring Justice Breyer spoke about that very notion less just last week, talking about you know the democracy and reiterating what we all know. And so um, I, if we're gonna start with changing the name to demonstrate the reality, well, we may have to start changing the name of the democracy too because we are aspiring with that notion of one person, one vote these days, right? You know, uh, we're, we're aspiring for a lot of different things happening right now. We talk about, um, you know, equality and, and, and gender equity. We're still aspiring for women to have agency over their bodies fully. So I, I would, if that, if that happens, if we open that floodgate, 
I'll swim, but we're going to have to mention a lot more than the DOJ in that equation, don't you think? <laughs> it is, it is, you're right. But if I worked for the Department of Defense, I would say, how about the Department of Offense? Right? We're talking about reality, right? Because that's what we're doing most of the time, right? But it's true. Well, that, is, that doesn't sound nice, because we're talking about it, right? See, it's all about public. It's marketing, my friend, right? It's marketing. America is still marketing itself to the world, so I hear you. But I, I'm with you. If they change it, i got to change a lot of my old business cards and resume, though. Like, D-O-L-S. Hmm, I don't know. <laughs> The book is Just Pursuit, uh, Black Prosecutors Fight for Fairness, received a rave from the New York Times. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Stephen Ray.